All right, hi everybody, welcome back. Today, uh, a history of marine biology. So let's go, let's check it out. So although we still have much to learn, uh, humans have been interacting and uh, we've been studying the ocean for a very long time. Uh, so that you can kind of follow along, I'm going to provide a timeline uh, on the left so you can kind of get a sense of when and where these events took place. When we talk about time, we generally reference events that happened before the Common Era or what we call BCE and events that happened in more recent times like now, and we call that the Common Era. If you read older textbooks or sources, you will probably see, or maybe you've seen, the words B.C. Uh, and A.D., which refer to before Christ and after death, but those refer to the same basic time periods. B.C.E. and C.E. have been used in scholarly journals um, since the 17th century, so they're really not actually all that new, and there's a whole long interesting story about this, and I'll put a link in the comments section below if you want to read up on that, but it's not required for the class, just something you might find interesting. So currently you are taking this class and it is around 2022 based on when I'm making the video or whenever you're taking the class. And so 2000 years ago was time zero and about 4,500 years ago would be 2500 BCE before common era. And that's when the pyramids in Egypt were built. But our history of the ocean goes back much further than that. So to really see humans in their history of the ocean, we need to really back up, uh, if you will, or greatly expand our timeline and go back several hundred thousand years to a time when our species Homo sapiens first appear in the fossil record, which is about 200,000 to 300,000 years ago. So while there are much older relatives of our species, such as Homo erectus and so forth, the first Homo sapien fossils found in South Africa are about 260,000 years old, Ethiopia around 195,000 years old, and recently in Morocco around 300,000 years ago. This suggests a good starting point for our story on a history of marine biology. Because in a seaside cave in South Africa, some of the oldest harpoons and fishing hooks are found, and scientists have approximately dated these to around 165,000 to 100,000 years ago. So these early humans probably traveled along the coast uh, along to the North Atlantic and probably used the ocean as a source of food dating back to the very beginning of our species of Homo sapiens or pretty close to that. So 100,000 to 200,000 years ago, humans begin to move then out of Africa um, which is around 98,000 BCE. So humans then migrated throughout Asia around 63,000 BCE. Now, to be clear, when I say out of Africa, what I mean is people began to move and occupy other places, but they aren't all leaving Africa. Some are obviously staying behind, uh, but the point is humans uh, are expanding into new locations and uh, also you should notice that I have changed the scale on the left to reflect uh, the timeline uh, as we are um, moving closer to the current time so it gives you some more room to sort of see what we're talking about. Humans crossed the islands of Southeast Asia and into Australia around 48,000 BCE and they migrated throughout Asia around 50,000 BCE and into Europe around 46 thousand BCE. Humans migrated across Asia and Russia and they eventually reached North America around 25,000 BCE. Now remember the earth is a globe so we need to reposition our picture to better see certain aspects of this history. So here is a view from the North Pole looking down onto the planet and so again here is Africa uh, right here, and this is where humans probably begin migrating into Asia from here and from across Asia and Russia this direction and you can see that North America is actually very close to the northeastern tip of Russia and Asia probably that occurred around 25,000 years ago. So you can see we're actually very close 
to that point right there. So going back to our original map, uh, that would look like this. But meanwhile, at that same time, humans are also spreading to the east from Australia and Papua New Guinea and places like that. So we need to rotate our Earth this direction um, so that we can see what's going on over there. And so we need to kind of be able to see that part. So here we can see the eastern coast uh, of Australia and the islands of e that are east of Taiwan and Papua New Guinea and Australia and so forth. And when we do this, we can see Homo sapiens reach uh, the Solomon Islands around 28,000 BCE. And so notice that this is before humans have reached North America, which again was 25,000 uh, BCE. And Samoa and Tonga uh, by about 1000 BCE. So it's interesting to me that so many thousands of years pass before the Polynesian ancestors travel further east, uh, but this appears to be consistent through other parts of the world as well. And it might just be that we have not found earlier evidence yet, uh, but Think about it, humans reached Solomon Islands 28,000 BCE, and before they reached Samoa, the Great Pyramids in Egypt are built in that time, and of course, a very different part of the world. Uh, by now, humans have reached Micronesia, Melanesia, and Polynesia, and they are very accomplished sailors. They reach the Hawaiian Islands by 300 CE, and Easter Island sometime between 400 and 800 CE. And so now that we have everybody spread out all over the world, we can kind of look at how history sort of unfolds from there. So keep in mind that these are histories um, that are running often simultaneously at the same time and independently of one another. Um, so for example, the Phoenicians back in Europe um, and North Africa, they are the first group of Western accomplished Western navigators, and they're settling around the Mediterranean Sea, the Black Sea, and the Eastern Atlantic around 2000 BCE, again, when the Great Pyramids are built. Meanwhile, uh, almost at the same time, starting maybe in 1500 BCE, the Pacific Islanders have established themselves as accomplished navigators, and they're sailing over vast distances uh, of the ocean with knowledge of wind and waves and stars for navigation, and they use animals like birds that are migrating across the ocean, sometimes during the day and changing direction at night, and they're using all this information to navigate the oceans over these vast distances, independent really of any other civilizations, uh, say in North America and in Europe. Although those are sort of happening again simultaneously, they're kind of learning all this information uh, on their own. And uh, they reach as far as Hawaii and the Hawaiian Islands uh, over the next 2,000 years. And about the same time that the Polynesians have reached Hawaii and Easter Island, back in Northern Europe, the Vikings from Scandinavia, which is modern day uh, Denmark, Norway, and Sweden, they're exploring the North Arctic Ocean. And one of the most famous of those explorers, uh, Viking explorers, is Leif Erikson, who leads a group that discovers North America for the second time uh, in around 900 CE. Also notice that once again, we need to change the size of our timeline, otherwise all the dates kind of just get squished together. Uh, so that's around 900 CE. And remember, the first North Americans have reached there, you know, that place by, you know, you know 25,000 years before that. Okay, so by around 1400 to 1500 CE, uh, many European explorers are out rediscovering places that are already inhabited by people. And for example, when Christopher Columbus arrives in the Caribbean in 1492, it has already been populated by humans for over 26,000 years. And the history of humans in the marine environment by this time is global. Um, whaling has started in Japan in about 1100 CE, and the Inuits of North America were hunting and fishing for marine life by this time as well. By the 1700s, European explorers are sailing the world in search of valuable resources, and James Cook uh, and the HMS Endeavor explore the Pacific Islands and finds Hawaii once again. It's already established that it, you know, several hundred years before that, 
Hawaiians have been there. And over his many trips, he eventually gets killed in Hawaii in 1779 over a dispute uh, over some stolen property. Charles Darwin and the HMS Beagle, another example in the 1831, represent one of the famous European voyages uh, with the goal of mapping the coast of South America. And Darwin, although he's mainly known for his theory of evolution by the process of natural selection, uh, he is also one of the world's leading experts on barnacles uh, in this time period. In the U.S., the United States Navy launches the Wilkes Expedition in 1838, and this is the first uh, marine exploration by the United States under the command of Charles Wilkes. And marine biologists are brought along, but uh, they're kind of referred to as clam diggers, sort of an insult to their sort of lower level of importance on this trip, uh, because at this time, science is kind of newer in the field of uh, biology, at least. And really the goal is more to chart uh, coastline and, and find where things are at. They collect 10,000 specimens along the way. In 1872, uh, the HMS Challenger uh, was refitted as a science vessel that was used before that, but in December 1872, it takes a three and a half year journey traveling 70,000 miles, uh, collecting a, a huge amount of new information. It takes 19 years to publish the 50 thick volumes uh, like an encyclopedia set of information and there's more information on the ocean discovered at that time than all of human history up to that point. Uh, as large ships begin to bring back dead specimens, scientists begin to question whether the organisms, uh, what they're like when they're alive. Uh, and marine labs begin to sort of be built uh, to study living organisms as much of what is brought back is just dead and nobody knows really how they live or what they do. One of the first of these labs was started by two Frenchmen, uh, Henry Milne Edwards and Victor Andouan in 1826, who began to visit the French seashore on a regular basis and start hanging out there, uh, making more observations of actually living organisms. Uh, Woods Hole, uh, after a rocky start, officially opens its door um, as the Marine Biological Laboratory at Woods Hole in 1888, still one of the most famous uh, marine biology um, laboratory stations uh, in the world. Uh, in the 1940s, sonar, which stands for sound, navigation, and ranging, um, uh, becomes important for submarine warfare during World War II, and suddenly uh, people start discovering that there's lots of sounds coming out of the ocean. Originally, it was thought that the ocean was just totally silent, but with the use of sonar, we started discovering that all kinds of organisms were making sounds, and that became a matter then of that became a matter of national security because we needed to know what animals were making the sounds and how to distinguish those from submarines, and so that became a very important part. Um, for the military uh, in terms of funding more research into um, sonar, particularly for animals. In the 1950s, SCUBA, which stands for Self-Contained Underwater Breathing Apparatus, was invented by two French scientists, Emily Gagnon, an engineer, and Jacques Cousteau, a famous um, marine biologist um, and would continue on his career. And that allowed people to stay underwater for long periods of time to make more observations and study the ocean, far more than what had been done previous to that. In the 1960s, John Walsh and Jacques Picard take a submarine designed by Picard's family member, a long history of scientists in that family, uh, to the deepest location in the ocean. They're the first to do this, which is the Mariana Trench, that is 36,037 feet deep. There have only been 21 people who have dived to the bottom of the Mariana Trench to this day, uh, which is far, far fewer than the 550 people that have actually been to space. Only 21 people um, have been to the bottom of the ocean. In the summer of 1970, Sylvia Earle leads an all-women's team of divers to live on what they call Tech Type 2. It's an underwater marine habitat and laboratory, 43 feet deep 
uh, in the ocean uh, off the U.S. Virgin Islands, where they stay between 10 and 20 days, depending on the, they, they kind of rotate them out. Dr. Sylvia Earle, who is 85 years old at the time of me making this video, continues to dive, and her main focus now is developing companies that lead to deep sea exploration and she has over 7,000 hours of dive experience and she's probably one of the most famous marine biologists uh, of modern times. In the 1980s and 1990s the use of satellites uh, has become common and the ability to track large marine mammals such as elephant seals and whales and sharks greatly enhances our knowledge of the ocean and these species and in the 2000s and into the current time the ability to design and build entire underwater marine labs that incorporate remote sensing and uh, the ability to collect more data than the entire history up until now and examples of those include the mars and the venus system uh, that are two examples that incorporate things like satellites and remote uh, robotic rovers, as well as information and temperature sensors and pressure sensors, and all of that is collecting um, huge amounts of information, uh, which is relatively a new ability that we did not have prior to that. As of now, as of today, uh, we have still only explored 5% of the ocean, only 5%. We've explored at least probably over 99% of the land but 95% of the ocean is still uh, unexplored. Partially because obviously the ocean is very big, for one, and, and the other factor is that humans up until recently, um, you know, without the technology as, as, a, as a species, our physiology does not really allow us to do well in the ocean. Okay, so that's the end of lecture 1.1b, a history of the marine environment.